If you were an oyster looking for a place to live in San Francisco Bay, you'd want to find a nice shallow spot with something hard to latch onto. It might be something like a rock or even an old ball kicked into the bay. Or it might be a 1,000 pound block made of sand, cement, and shells with big holes in it. <laughs> In May 2019, a group of people who had worked for over three years to create more places for oysters to live in San Francisco Bay gathered to watch the construction of the giant marsh living shorelines project. As they watched, the barge and crew of Triton Marine moved 350 housing units especially designed for native oysters into the shallows off the Point Pinole regional shoreline. This living shorelines project organized by the California Coastal Conservancy and 18 other partners, represents the first time these kinds of habitats have been built underwater on such a large scale in our region. The project will also help us test whether this softer, nature-based infrastructure can do just as good a job of protecting us from storms and rising sea levels as more concrete. So that is our barge and crane coming in to do work on oyster reef construction. That's Triton Marine. Um, they brought a very shallow barge that can get into this shallow area. And once they get into this area, they'll start using that big crane to place oyster reef elements into the water. Why are you interested in building a living shoreline here on here in this park? Uh, well, there's extremely important marshes um, in this area and there's uh, great habitat along the shoreline. And in order to protect those areas from sea level rise and from climate change, it's really important to um, look at solutions to limit coastal erosion. And uh, the Living Shoreline Project really can, it can do that in a way that provides additional habitat. So we're not using physical um, engineered structures to protect the marshes, but we're using other habitat features that really enhance the overall function of the marsh area. The triumphant crew returns! So this has been three years of planning and permitting, and it's a really tight seasonal window when we can actually do this work. That's because we have to avoid any impacts to like salmon migration season or osprey nesting season or other species considerations that we have to think about. So this is the perfect time of year, spring and summer, um, for them to come in and place the elements. And then on top of that, they have to very carefully time it with the tide cycle. So that's why they're coming in on a high tide right now. They'll then place elements through the full high-low tide cycle, and then they have to wait for another high tide to get back out. We ended up doing three treatment locations, and one of them is deeper, and that's really optimized for the oyster colonization. And then there's one, this one is shallower, which is a bit more uh, geared towards the shoreline protection. And we used uh, wave modeling to look at how much energy dissipation we could expect as we were making some of those decisions. Big cranes and barges don't slip in and out of the shallows as easily as the larvae of a native Olympia oyster. Managers went through a lot of different ideas for how to handle the logistics of the project without spending too much time or money damaging the eelgrass or getting stuck in the mud. When we started talking with contractors about how they would ideally like to do the work, we didn't actually expect that they would want to be able to ground their barges and rest them on the bottom. But because of the very constrained tidal um, conditions under which they would want to place the elements and trying to install them, we found that that was actually a preferred methodology. We actually had to work with the regulatory agencies to identify uh, basically like pounds per square inch of pressure on the bottom. What type of indentation will that leave? Will that impact any bottom dwelling organisms? Uh, we have some, basically, we have some really good eelgrass mapping out here so we can ensure that the contractor is resting the barge at locations where eelgrass is not present, which is the biggest biological consideration. When eelgrass is around, the fish and ducks all do better, which is why the Giant Marsh Project also includes sending crews out into the subtidal zone to plant this ecosystem builder. For the reef elements that have been deployed elsewhere, there's an immediate response from diving ducks. So there's a whole, in Pacific Herring, there's a whole community around these subtidal elements that we're putting in that are gonna benefit. In 2007, 
a ship called the Cosco Busan crashed into the Bay Bridge and spilled 54,000 gallons of oil. The spill slimed and smothered acres of intertidal habitats and covered hundreds of water birds and black goo. So this project um, uh, was interesting to us because with the Costco Busan uh, settlement funds, we look at projects that would fulfill a variety of benefits, um, especially those uh, organisms that were impacted by the spill. In this case, there were native oyster reefs that were impacted by the spill, um, rockweed beds, seagrass beds, and as well herring and various other fishes. So this project contributes to a lot of those resources that were injured and impacted from that spill. The Giant Marsh Living Shorelines project will cost three million dollars and take several seasons to complete. It's all part of an ambitious experiment to build and link multiple habitats on our shores and jumpstart a healthier ecosystem. Yeah, I think what keeps you up at night maybe, how do we deal with this on a larger scale? And how do we uh, scale up these efforts to do them um, to benefit more people, more communities, and to protect our shorelines? I know that there was so many pieces um, that had to come together to make this happen and so all the various agencies and all the people that work together really, really need a big applause for, for this day. <laughs> okay, we gotta pop this sucker. At least we got the sound. As the bay gets bigger with climate change, many areas may need seawalls to protect them. Soft spots like the giant marsh and the new oyster reefs at Point Pinole can help absorb more flooding. But can we build all this new natural infrastructure in time? Mm -hmm.